good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this uh, first therapeutic update lecture series for 2020. Uh, today we are having the therapeutic update on non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. And uh, we have got Professor Anuradha Dasanayaka, uh, who is a professor in pharmacology and a consultant physician. Uh, he is attached to the uh, Faculty of Medicine University of Ruhuna. And uh, he, sorry, uh, Mr. Kalania, I'm sorry, Mr. Kalania. And uh, he has been working in the area of liver disease, I know, for a long period of time uh, and has uh, extensive publications in this area. So it is my pleasure to um, invite my fellow pharmacologist from the University of Kalania to give this presentation. for inviting me and for the kind words of introduction. So, uh, quite interesting topic and complicated topic, uh, but we have done a fair amount of work on the field in Sri Lanka and I will try my best to do justice to the topic over the next hour or so. Uh, as usual, uh, we'll start with the history of fatty liver, a very interesting history we have got. Uh, this is uh, foie gras, uh, bird fatty liver. Uh, it's expensive delicacy of the French uh, royals and aristocrats. Uh, now produced commercially by force feeding birds. Uh, the duck and the geese. Uh, the ancient Egyptians uh, first started doing this. Uh, they noticed that migratory birds, just before their departure back home, uh, start uh, eating profusely and become very fat. And uh, their liver is becoming uh, 10 times as large as the no uh, normal liver. And uh, they, after uh, getting that, those fat bellies and big livers, they fly back home non-stop. The, the longest uh, track, uh, the recorded uh, distance travel is from New Zealand to uh, China non-stop eight days and you know, it's about 8,000 miles. So till they burn all their fat in their livers, they fly non-stop. Uh, so the, uh, uh, the inference is that you can accumulate fat in your liver very quickly and you can get rid of your fat also as quickly. Uh, then what happened was that uh, off-season, when they wanted to taste fatty liver, uh, the ancient Egyptians started feeding domesticated birds like the duck and the geese. And this, uh, which is from uh, Pyramid, 7,000 years ago, and still uh, preserved at the Louvre Museum in Paris. Uh, then Apicius, the Roman uh, chef, famous Roman chef, wrote about foie gras 2,000 years ago. And the Roman historian, Pliny the Elder, has written that Marcus Apicius, the chef, would make fatty liver in the bird by feeding these dates and raising. So now we know that dried fruits are a good source of sucrose. So he fed those with dates and made their livers fat. So now we know that sucrose is very bad for the liver. Uh, history of fatty liver in the humans, uh, it was known to occur in diabetics for over a century, uh, but uh, the epidemic started after the uh, uh, epidemic of fast food and uh, production of high fructose corn syrup. Uh, this high fructose corn syrup you started uh, as a cheap and cost-effective alternative to table sugar. You know, there was a deficiency of scarcity of table sugar in the 1970s. And uh, this uh, uh, HFCS, the corn syrup was uh, produced from corn. And that led to uh, an epidemic of fatty liver and also the fast food epidemic. Uh, the fast food consumption started in uh, 50s, in the 50s. So what, I, what, is the, what are the characteristics of a fast food? 
So these are the characteristics according to Wikipedia. Uh, prepared quicker than traditional food. So you can prepare them within minutes. Easy take away through a drive through. Relatively cheap, very, very cheap compared to normal meal. Very poor nutritional value. And it's harmful and contains processed meat, saturated fats, sugar, salt and high in calories. And linked to the, all these epidemics of diabetes, obesity, cholesterol, cancer and fatty liver. Uh, so what are the nephled or fatty liver milestones? Uh, relatively new liver disease and people started talking about it in 1980s. Before that, it was zero, just called a cryptogenic cirrhosis or whatever. Uh, so it's one of those newer liver diseases compared to old was hemochromatosis, Wilson's, they were known for ages, centuries, perhaps. Uh, so probably it was not common. All started after the uh, uh, epidemic of this high fructose corn syrup and fast food epidemic. And this is the person who described uh, uh, fatty liver first. Uh, Jürgen Ludwig in 20 patients uh, at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, then by 1990 we know that uh, uh, Nash was leading to cirrhosis and probably the main etiology factor behind cryptogenic cirrhosis and uh, uh, people published that uh, article. Then Elizabeth Brunt was the one who uh, 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 first described the grading of or quantifying the liver fat and he uh, uh, graded it to one, two, three depending on various uh, characteristics like fat accumulation, the amount of fat, degree of fat, the cell ballooning and the degree of inflammation and the degree of fibrosis. Uh, then 2004, this exper experimental drug, obeticolic acid, was shown to be working in rats, right, so that was 2004. And now 2019, after 15 years, that we know that it is working humans. That's how long it takes for drug development for, from uh, animal studies to human studies. So after 15 years, it's known that it's working in uh, in, the, in humans, and probably within next year, it will come into uh, guidelines. Or we call it, I said it has multiple actions preventing inflammation, fibrosis lipid metabolism on atherosclerosis, bile acid homeostasis and glucose metabolism. Acts on the effects are receptor. It's quite similar to, uh, not identical to acidoxycholic acid, but uh, something like acidoxycholic acid. Uh, then 2004, same year, uh, there was a publication linking uh, the improvement to weight loss. Uh, so still uh, one of the main methods of, methods of treatment. And 2008, uh, Romeo published this article describing the genes involved in uh, fatty liver uh, uh, in the in the Nature Genetics Journal. And even even before that, we knew that it is familiar, but surprisingly, it took such a long time to uh, for them to uh, uh, find evidence for uh, the heritability of the fatty liver. Uh, by 2010, uh, vitamin E and pyoglitazone uh, uh, trials came out and shown to be beneficial. And uh, uh, by 2015, this uh, uh, great study by Villa Gomez from Cuba showed that more than if you lose more than 10% of your very difficult thing to do, you can even think of reversing your fibrosis. So one of those landmark studies, 2015. Uh, uh, then, uh, first human study on uh, uh, obeticolic acid in uh, NAFL, a phase two trial of the famous Flint, Flint study in 2015, which shows that in about 300 people, it's really uh, beneficial in uh, established non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Uh, then, uh, LF people know the dual PIPA agonist uh, drug, something like pyoglitazone, uh, uh, is still undergoing phase 3 trial and still the results are not yet out. The study was started in 2016. And uh, uh, 2018, uh, the 
uh, when it was 2018, there were two more studies, phase two, phase three, one on yellow fibrino, one on uh, uh, obeticolic acid. So if the results are okay from a phase three study, uh, it's very likely that it will, uh, it will be recommended and uh, will come to uh, guidelines soon. Uh, 2019, interim results of one of those trials, the obeticolic acid trial, the region rate trial, uh, came out and incrementalized beneficial and probably results will come out in 2021, full uh, full results after four years and very likely to that uh, obeticolic acid available in this country, uh, likely to be uh, approved by the FDA and to into guidelines by 2021. Uh, yeah, 2021. Uh, so what is fatty liver or non-alcoholic hepatitis or, or uh, uh, fat-related liver disease? It's a very, very complicated metabolic liver disease. And in fact, it's a multi-system disease. So uh, because we have done fair amount of uh, work on this field from Ragama, uh, these all published data from Ragama. In 2007, there were 33% of adults, this three th cohort of 3,000 patients, we did ultrasound scan, uh, depending on strict ultrasound criteria in 2007. 3,000 patients, 35 to 45, then 45 to 55, and 55 to 65, three age groups. And uh, in, in urban areas around Ragama, 33%. Then we went to the estate sector, and there it was in Talawagale, 18%. When we repeated same, in the same cohort after eight years in 2015, and this 33% has doubled. So the uh, incidence has doubled over the eight years, and uh, and now they are elderly, nearly nearing 70 years, most of them. So, and the rates are much worse in diabetes, and maybe almost all of the diabetics may be having fatty liver. And, uh, and it's the number one liver disease in the country, and if you take the transplantation referrals, most of them are early to us alcoholic liver disease, but now it is fatty liver. And, uh, and if you want, when they want to do transplantation, live donor, most of the live donor patients have fatty liver, so they can't donate when they have fatty liver. And the association, we have done it, and it's quite there here in Sri Lanka as well, PNPLA3, and it's the most common cause for hepatocellular carcinoma as well in Sri Lanka and recurs in almost all transplanted livers transplanted for cryptogenic cirrhosis. Uh, then some people have non-progressive fatty liver. So they have fatty liver till they die but they don't develop cirrhosis. It's called non-progressive fatty liver. It's a common fatty liver we have and they are near zero liver mortality. They die of either heart disease or hypertension or other cause, uh, their cardiovascular mortality is high. But about 5% of them uh, when develop NASH or non-alcoholic hepatitis, which is going to uh, uh, get, these people will get fibrosis, cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. And the rate of progression varies from patient to patient. And, and this is a very complex disease process and we really do not know exactly why this is happening in this five percent of people. And and the bad thing is that NASH, NASH can progress with normal liver enzymes. So till you develop cirrhosis or hepatocellular carcinoma, you will not know that you are having fatty liver, which is progressive and this exact mechanism of progression is not still clearly understood. Uh, this is what's happening. Maybe fast food some kind of a toxin. Then, maybe starting in childhood, and over the years, by the time they develop uh, uh, cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma, you are around 50, 60, 70. So, it's a prolonged illness, and each stage may be taking years, 10 to 20 years, from uh, even fibrosis to cirrhosis, and when child's A cirrhosis to child's C cirrhosis, it's a very prolonged uh, cause of fat. Uh, uh, disease and the good thing is that you can intervene at each step even after development of cirrhosis you can intervene and that's the only good thing about this it's a, it's a fairly uh, prolonged illness and uh, probably starts with all fatty food and you know 
saturated foods and fructose and other things. Right? Then, then you may be having other components like inflammation, oxidative stress, apoptosis, regeneration, fibrogenesis, and even genetic susceptibility. And that's why I said only 5% is progressing, and rest of them, their cardiovascular mortality is going to be high. Uh, so what are the major contributors? Insulin resistance, lipotoxicity, genetics. Lipotoxicity is where you get some kind of a uh, lipid associated inflammation process starting when you have what's called ectopic tissue. Ectopic adipose tissue is where you have fat, where you have fat where play, where fat shouldn't be, like the liver, epicardium or omenta. Uh, then this is the uh, new kid on the block, what's called the gut dysbiosis, changes in the gut microbiome. We all have about two kilograms of bacteria inside our gut and changes there triggered by various bad food habits, fructose, saturated fats, antibiotics, bile acids and various uh, bile acid pathways. So we really do not know what exactly makes your microbiome uh, starts misbehaving, but uh, that's one of those areas for research and there are a lot of research ongoing in this area. Uh, what are the risk factors uh, uh, for uh, progression? Because it's a multi-system disease, uh, you can have other uh, uh, involvement of other organs and systems and if you have this then the rate of progression is high. So if you, uh, have, if you have NASH uh, and diabetes then your risk of getting uh, cirrhosis is much higher. So real reason we do not know and on the other hand if you have uh, fatty liver your risk of dying from heart attack is also much higher. Probably same illness happening everywhere. Uh, so even in the use, what's the plight of these patients? So a lot of them will present, even in the US, the result, end results is that you will not know till you present with the hepatocellular carcinoma or the first episode of hematomasis or ankle swelling because it's a silent killer. You, don't, you, you, you will be asymptomatic till you lose 70% of your liver. So even in the US, the presentation probably is the first episode of decompensation and if you present with hepatocellular carcinoma that will be the end but if you present with some something like hematomesis there's time for a transplant if you present with uh, diffuse type of hepatocellular carcinoma uh, probably that's the uh, end of that patient as well unfortunately so it's a silent killer so at the moment uh, uh, so I made this uh, slide in 2018, but it should be 2020. There are two areas for of research at the moment to develop a drug and the drug. See the drug budget on now. More than 100 drugs are being tested. The real reason is that now in the U.S., hepatitis C was the uh, number one liver disease up to two three years ago. Now there is a treatment. There is treatment for hepatitis C. Now they are focusing on fatty liver because fatty liver has suddenly become the number one liver disease in the world, in the U.S. So if a disease is common in the U.S., drug firms, firms starts going, going behind that illness. So now there are more than, more than 100 drugs in phase 2 and phase 3 trials dealing on fatty liver because, you know, if you develop a drug, you know that you are going to, uh, you know, be very rich, that drug company. And also non-invasive marker. Now we are going to move away from uh, uh, biopsy to diagnose uh, fatty liver because you have to start treating, you have to diagnose who is the person who is going to uh, pro uh, progress into, I said 95% is not going to progress. I'm going to catch that 5% and start treatment. That's going to be the idea. So how do you catch a patient who is having who is developing fibrosis through non-invasive markers you don't have to do biopsy do one of these and of these fibro scan and these various score systems have come out uh, into the open so these are the uh, scoring systems these are very simple and they are as good as these 
complex uh, imaging techniques. Just the ASTLT ratio, AST to platelet ratio, and I am very fond of this FIB4 score. I will tell you how to use FIB4 score and the Nelfeld fibrosis score. Now this is the fibro scan, the imaging method uh, coming up big time. Uh, just like an ultrasound scan, you have a probe there and you have a scan machine like ultrasound scan and then you, it's a non-invasive five minute job and uh, then you get a report with uh, two values. This 204 or 209 here is the fat quantification and uh, 3.5 here and 33.3 here, it's the liver stiffness in kilopascals. 3.5 is normal if it is 33 cirrhosis. More than 12 is cirrhosis, up to 7 it's normal, 7 to 12 is fibrosis, more than 12 is cirrhosis. So 30, this is cirrhotic, this is amount of fat here. So this is one of those and we have uh, two fibro scans in the country at the moment, one at Ragaman, one in the private sector just like an ultrasound scan, uh, very operator friendly. And uh, as I told you before, this is the fire, uh, degree of the, the stiffness in kilopascals, more than 12.5 cirrhosis, and less than seven normal, and between seven and 12, fibrosis, and uh, 9.5 to significant fibrosis. This is the area we are targeting for treatment because fibrosis has started. So. If the fibrosis process has not started, then they don't have or they have there is minimal liver-related mortality. But this starts progressing, the fibrosis sets in, then over the next 10, 20, 30 years, the patient is going to develop hepatocellular carcinoma, cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. So at the moment, uh, fibroscan uh, will tell you exactly uh, uh, with certainty that there is certain degree of fibrosis setting in. So then uh, more simple uh, serological markers, just check your AST, ALT and the platelet count and the age. Just four variables and you get you know, uh, a uh, sell out and go to the internet and download this FIBO score. Uh, or app and just calculate it and uh, if your average is 3.25 then uh, it's advanced fibrosis. I will give you a few examples for the FIB4 score. Uh, if the FIB4 score uh, is 0.56, you know, this is what we see in most of the people now. Age 30, ALT is 80, AST is 40. This ratio is absolutely important. ALT higher than AST is good news. There is no fibrosis and the platelet count normal and use that, get the score 0.56 is much lower than 1.45 and uh, this is no fibrosis and and if there is no fibrosis you don't have to proceed with the uh, fibro scan or any further with a biopsy and if this is so repeat non-invasive markers in two to three years this is the fit for score for a kind of you know common patient that we see with fatty liver uh, example 2, now the patient has aged, ALT has come down a bit, AST has gone up, platelet slightly reduced. So, you put that, FIB4 is going to come around 2.17. This is bad news. It is more than 1.45, but less than 3.45. 3.5, this is fibrosis. And this patient needs a fibroscan, and the fibroscan confirms that there is fibrosis. The guidelines say to do a biopsy and start on treatment. But biopsy is invasive, but still with these two, uh, although it's not uh, uh, in the guidelines, we tend to treat them. This is another example. This is a cirrhotic, basically. Aging, ALT is lower than AST. AST has reversed now. Platelets further down. FIB4 score, then this is established cirrhosis. You do a CTO biopsy to diagnose this. Okay, uh, so what's wrong with the biopsy now? We all, uh, when we were students, we all, we were told that cirrhosis is a biopsy diagnosis. Hepatocellular carcinoma is a biopsy diagnosis. But it's no longer true. Why? It's invasive, some carries some mortality and carries some degree of morbidity. Uh, 
hospital stay of at least a day or two. It's painful, and and the sampling issue, sampling issue is also there. This is not considered given, not given priority. Only one in fifty thousand of the liver. So there can be a sample error. And uh, see here now, if you do the biopsy in this area and this area, see the difference. So if you do the biopsy from this area, 60% of the liver is fibrous. If you do the biopsy from this area, only 50. So what it says is, because of this, you can interpret the uh, uh, degree of fibrosis very differently, depending on from where you biopsy. Uh, so because of that, fibro scan is gaining momentum. Now, see, I told you about this microbiome issue. And what's happening? So gut microbiome has been identified identified as a regulator of energy in homeostasis and fat deposition. So all those two kilograms of gut microbiome is function as a separate organ. So how does it change? Probably saturated fats, fructose, and maybe antibiotics and maybe genetics. And then these changes in the gut microbiome can lead to production of various uh, bacterial products and then due to leaky guts with this production of these toxins from bacterial uh, metabolism or whatever it tends to leak into the circulation and gets deposited in the liver as endotoxins, short chain fatty acids and liposaccharides and then it alters metabolism of the bile acids and leading to lipid accumulation and inflammation in Nephil. So, uh, diet, the typical Western diet, aided by differences in the age, lifestyle, genetics, and antibiotics, so changes in the gut microbiome leading to all these NCDs obesity, diabetes, IBD, fatty liver, cancer, autism. Okay, this uh, changes in the gut microbiome, what's called leaky guts, all these toxins from the change cut microbiome reaching the liver and fibrosis leading to cirrhosis. Here, if the, there are no changes in the microbiome, you get a normal liver. Right, to treatment part, uh, uh, non-pharmacological treatment and uh, pharmacology treatment I am going to deal separately and treatment of other risk factors also. Uh, non-pharmacological weight reduction as I said before, low calorie, low fructose, low fast food, and processed food. So we all know that these are dangerous. So all sweets to be avoided, especially commercially made desserts like ice creams, cakes, chocolates, then processed food, uh, and in addition, a low calorie diet for all those people with fatty liver. Even for normal people, I think that's the way forward. Uh, then, uh, then weight reduction. This the as I said the landmark study from Cuba. So the issue is, if you lose more than five percent fat, the ballooning and inflammation is reduced. If you lose then more than seven percent, resolution of NASH, and if you more than lose more than ten percent, reversal of fibrosis. So if you catch someone around this. Uh, as I said, the uh, fibrosis stage of between 7 and 12, if you can lose 10% of your weight, it itself can reverse your fibrosis. So how to achieve 10% of weight? Now, according to this study, this is uh, uh, what they did. Uh, this tells you better. Yeah, so calorie reduction. This is the study from Villa Gomez from Cuba. 750 kilocalories less than the daily requirement. So daily requirement according to your sex, age, and the job you do, Mayfield's and Joey equation. And so if your requirement is 2,500 kilocalories, you reduce it to 750. So that's reduced 750 and that's 1,750. <coughs> and go to a dietitian, uh, get a diet chart according to your culture and so on. And then you prepare a daily food diary plus 200 minutes of walking per week and meeting them to promote and adhere to diet every six weeks, 88 weeks. And in this study, 
diabetics were included and almost all were white. So, uh, unfortunately, none of these studies that I am going to mention has any South Asian or Asian for that matter involvement. So, we really do not know whether we can extrapolate all this data into South Asian uh, patients. But here, all these studies are done in whites. So, uh, uh, all were overweight or obese, and because of this, vitamin E and pyoglutazone are known to benefit uh, these uh, NASH, they were excluded from this study. Uh, no vitamin E or pyoglutazone were allowed, and by statins were allowed. Uh, so, uh, 39 uh, declined a second biopsy, and uh, with all these strict protocol, only 30% achieve a weight loss of more than 5%. And even with this strictness of protocols, to the 200 some fair amount of could not achieve weight loss and very few people achieved the target weight loss of 10%. And there were no lean nephil patients in the study. So why, so with the strictness of protocols, why you can't reduce weight? That's the reason behind it, because obesity is a complex Neuropsychological illness. If you become fat, very easy, very difficult to lose weight after that. Uh, so calorie reduction leads to energy conservation. So there's a major issue here. And, and after some time, you say, oh, no point of uh, uh, calorie restriction because I'm not losing weight. If you start eating normally, you gain weight because calorie uh, energy conservation persists. So some. That's what they say, I, I have try, been trying to reduce weight, I am eating less, but I am gaining weight. That can be true after all, because body has uh, uh, geared for energy conservation, and when you start eating normally again, you gain weight. So that's why people who try to lose weight, end up gaining weight. Uh, weight reduction, how realistic is weight reduction? If it, has, if it is to be realistic, it has to be a multidisciplinary approach. You should have weight loss clinics specific clinic for this and frequent monitoring, calorie reduction, exercise and you can have you know uh, other helpful uh, drugs like even all stat and even bariatric surgery so it's a very complex uh, approach you need to uh, sustain a weight reduction. Uh, so liver physicians can they how can they help? I think for liver physicians it's extremely difficult for to achieve weight while dealing with other liver people, I think we should have some kind of a good referral system or either we have to learn, we have to become a food expert or a weight, -losing, uh, weight loss expert because you have to learn the subject and start dealing with, that's probably one of those, uh, one of the, uh, you know, one of the two alternatives you have to help these patients with fatty liver. Uh, all is that uh, is useful but not strong enough. Uh, and it's not recommended in guidelines. So there are two studies uh, saying that uh, all is that reduces weight and beneficial in fatty liver, but I don't think it's strong enough to be re recommended uh, in everyday use. But in selected people uh, for kind kind of you know very smaller degree of weight loss, it can be recommended. Uh, coffee is very well known to be beneficial and in fatty liver and uh, fatty liver if you uh, uh, take coffee. It's known that fat, in fact, coffee is beneficial in established cirrhosis as well. And one of these uh, recommended, uh, recommended uh, alternatives that you have as a drink because you can't recommend alcohol at all, even in safe limits. And uh, uh, the, the cirrhotics should not be drinking at all. If you have cirrhosis, drinking is out, not even the safe limit. And, uh, and insufficient data to with the uh, say, uh, uh, fatty liver, uh, the non-alcoholic fatty liver patients benefit from safe drinking, but uh, advice is to avoid alcohol totally because these two illnesses are very, very similar. Uh, fructose, uh, the sweet, uh, is a little bit different from uh, table sugar, aids lipogenesis and blocks fatty acid oxidation and increases production of uric acid. So fructose uh, is very toxic to the liver. So toxic that uh, you know people are thinking of what's called fructoholism like alcoholism. I will show you a slide there. So what are the fructose containing uh, uh, foods? Table sugar, 
dried fruits like dates, figs and raisins, then all these uh, sweet things like honey, kitul treacle, jaggery, then fructose corn syrup, all soft drinks like colas, fantas, cordials, all commercially made desserts. So all commercially made desserts are uh, full of high fructose corn syrup or sugar syrup which ultimately end up with, uh, uh, with the deposition of fat in your liver. This is what I call fructoholism, it's like alcoholism. Fructose is a major component of table sugar and of many added sugar syrups and excessive fructose com consumption can lead to addictive behavior which is called fructoholism. So uh, fructose metabolization leads to hepatic steatosis and cirrhosis and it's called fructoholic liver disease. This uh, 2019 only this uh, hepatology, the number one liver journal published this uh, slide. And we need global strategies to reduce ingestion of added sugar, education campaign to promote healthy diet, increasing taxes on foods. And, and some of these things are even uh, practiced in Sri Lanka. So I think the worst thing that you can give your child is uh, commercially available sweets and desserts. Uh, what about artificial sugars like sweeteners, aspartame, sucralose, saccharin? Uh, what are the data for them? Whether they are beneficial? Apparently, they are not beneficial. Uh, stevia is coming to Sri Lanka now. Uh, but you can use wisely, but uh, may worsen obesity and diabetes because may increase the craving for real sugar. Uh, you can hoodwink your taste buds, but you can't hoodwink your brain. So some whatever you do will because there is no increase of your glucose levels in your blood after tasting this, and you can end up with craving for sugar. So still uh, curious on, but uh, I don't think uh, we have any data to comment on artificial sweetness whether they are beneficial in the long term or not. Uh, bariatric surgery, uh, bariatric surgery surely. There is weight reduction, whether you can recommend bariatric surgery for fatty liver, still we do not know. And this is what happens with bariatric surgery, you have a normal gut, normal microbiome diversity. In obese, there is low diversity, so there is a major change in the gut microbiome diversity in fat people. And with these uh, various uh, gastric bypass uh, surgeries and you know, surgeries. there is evidence to say that there are changes in the gut, to my, my gut microbiome uh, which, uh, which transfers from uh, low diversity to high diversity. In fact, the norm. So, with gastric bypass surgeries, some of them, your microbiome, gut microbiome become normal. So, that can end up with fairly uh, uh, significant weight loss. In fact, uh, at the moment, the uh, most uh, uh, useful uh, method of uh, losing weight is bariatric surgery. So what is the future for bariatric surgery? Uh, so how do you justify undergoing such big operation for these people? Morbid obese have limited life expectancy. You have to convince them that if you are say 150, 160 kilos or 40, 45 BME, you are not going to live long. So might as well risk, take the risk of undergoing surgery and the risk may be acceptable in expert hands and in expert centers. So every year in the US, there are 200 to 300,000 bariatric surgeries being done. And, and the timing of surgery is important and you have to do it before development of major medical complications. So ideal ideal age is if you are morbid, if you are morbidly obese, it's around, if you are very obese, think of a bariatric surgery around the age of 40 before the development of major complication. Uh, fecal transplant uh, to change the gut microbiome. Uh, there are a uh, lot of uh, research going on in the field, but still no evidence to, it's useful in uh, Clostridium difficile or pseudomembranous colitis, that's the only evidence-based indication for fecal transplantation at the moment, but uh, there are research going on with by changing the fecal 
gut microbiome through fecal transplantation, even in fatty liver, but still, uh, no, there's no firm evidence to robust evidence to suggest that it's beneficial in fatty liver. Uh, pharmacological therapy, uh, I'm going to concentrate to two kinds of drugs. Currently available medication shown to be beneficial, and that is vitamin E, pyoprednisone, and incretins, liraglutide. These are being used for various other purposes. And drugs coming through developmental of development, drugs developed, developed by the industry. So it's very specific fatty liver drugs, obeticolic acid and elafeprino. I'm going to talk on those two drugs. And other drugs which are very useful in patients with fatty liver-like statins. Uh, so, uh, so this is where you can intervene. This is the liver, and this corner of the spectrum is fibrosis and cirrhosis, and it all starts with uh, accumulation of lipid in the liver. It's so what's called de novo lipid synthesis in the liver, or lipid coming from outside getting deposited in the hepatocyte. So various pathways uh, are being uh, analyzed and you know research is on whether you can reduce the absorption through all is that to uh, PEP agonists like pyoglitazone and elafiprino, vitamin E to reduce oxidative stress, pentoxophilin to reduce oxidative stress. Uh, uh, anti-fibrotic agents like CMO to Sumer. So all this uh, research is going on still, but I'm going to talk about two main uh, areas. Uh, 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 the uh, inflammation and bile, bile acid pathways. Right, okay. So start with the PIVENS trial. Uh, we are uh, in 2010 by Sunnel from US. Uh, they compared vitamin E and pyoglitazone with placebo. So both of them were beneficial, vitamin E in non-diabetics and pyoglitazone in diabetics. Uh, then uh, liraglutide uh, in creatine, uh, it's a small study, it's a fairly well-established well drug in diabetes and proven to be beneficial in a rather small study, unfortunately. The uh, study was too small to be uh, recommended in guidelines. Then uh, came the Flint trial, the obeticolic acid trial uh, in 2015. Yeah, uh, 25 milligrams of obeticolic acid or placebo, and this is a phase two trial, 300 pa 283 patients, and uh, uh, shown to be beneficial and which led to the large regenerate trial, phase 3 trial uh, and the uh, results of uh, interim results were published last year in the European uh, Society meeting and see the improvement in the fibrosis 38% with the higher dose compared to 23% with the placebo. So that is interim analysis and full analysis uh, uh, end of the research analysis is expected in 2021 and already the drug is uh, you know, gaining momentum and even uh, we have this drug in Sri Lanka at the moment for high risk patients when we feel as if we can't wait till 2021 we have started few patients uh, on nobody acid already not very expensive at the moment uh, Elafiprino I'm going to not going to talk a lot because the phase 3 trial is on, it's something like pyoglitazone and uh, still uh, results are not out and uh, probably within next two years we will see the results. Um, okay, so these are the currently some ongoing uh, drugs, obeticlook acid phase 3 and uh, elafiprino phase 3, all others are still uh, phase 2 trials. Okay, uh, last few slides I'm going to concentrate on statins. So statins and the liver, so it's a huge topic now. Uh, statins have pleiotrophic effects, anti-inflammatory, anti-angiogenic, and anti-fibrotic effect. So it should have some beneficial uh, effects on cirrhosis. Statins are remarkably safe in liver disease and should be used if indicated. 
statins will safeguard the coronaries. One of the main reasons that we need statins in this people is that uh, when they are when the cirrhosis patients develop decompensation, then are in need of a transplant. We can't transplant them because they have coronary artery disease and kidney disease. So we need the kidneys and the coronaries in good shape for them to undergo a transplant because they need eight to ten hours of anesthesia for liver transplantation. So, so as most of these uh, cirrhotic patients uh, have metabolic syndrome and concomitant diabetes and coronary artery disease, <coughs> they automatically become poor candidates for liver transplant. One of the reasons why all these NASH patients or fatty liver patients should be on a statin from the beginning is that in a way it helps the liver as well because a lot of studies are coming out that it's beneficial in liver disease, both fatty liver and decompensated cirrhosis. And at the same time, we need their coronaries in good shape for them to have a transplant. Uh, so statins may <coughs> delay decompensation and hepatocellular carcinoma in patients with early cirrhosis. If someone asks me what's the drug that you give a patient with compensated cirrhosis, my answer would be statins now. So statins like in uh, coronary artery disease is going to be hugely beneficial in patients with advanced liver disease. But unfortunately, they have not been tested adequately in uh, NASH comparing it with other uh, drugs. So treatment with statins, definitely safe in non-alcoholic state of hepatitis and compensated cirrhosis and dramatic the evidence to suggest that there is dramatic decrease. I said it's anti-angiogenic and anti-fibrotic. Dramatic decrease in hepatocellular <coughs> carcinoma in patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus on study. All these epidemiological studies and less severe NASH in dyslipidemia as on statins and improved liver function testing in some cases. So if there is uh, indication of statin, please use statin in non-alcoholic steroid hepatitis if the, even if the enzymes are marginally raised. Uh, what about the guidelines? We have an issue with guidelines. Uh, so we have two, three main guidelines to uh, 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 direct our treatment of these patients. One, the American guidelines, the one, European guidelines, and third one is Asia Pacific guidelines. Uh, none of them, the both American and uh, European guidelines, they uh, they recommend they recommend. Uh, they are recommendations uh, based on studies from uh, Europe and as I said most of these studies are on uh, white Caucasians. Because of that, you know, the Asia Pacific guidelines generally do not consider them as representative of Asians. It happens to, I think, cardiac drugs also. So, I think our NASH is different and at least one study to say that our fatty livers or our cirrhotics are more, our cirrhosis NASH is more aggressive and occur at a younger age and our rates of hepatocellular carcinoma are high. So I think our cirrhosis uh, uh, is different from what, what we see uh, from the West. So unfortunately we don't have a lot of studies on them. And uh, so, so the guidelines recommend vitamin E patients who are non-diabetics and who have a proven NASH in the biopsy. So most of our, then our patients are diabetics and they don't have a biopsy. So then are we going to withhold vitamin E or obeticlocolic acid in patients? So if we treat them with them, then it becomes off-label treatment. So is off-label treatment is a crime? No. Because even in the US, 20% of all prescriptions are off-label and even the people who write those guidelines uh, recommend these drugs in their clinical practice. So what we say is that even if the guidelines say start vitamin E in a patient who is biopsy proven NASH, who is not a diabetic, and what I say is that if the patient is progressing to cirrhosis in front of your own eyes, might as well treat them with vitamin E or colic acid even if it is not recommended. I may be wrong, but that's what I feel because we, if we stick to guidelines, we can't treat 90% of our patients. Okay, so what happens if you see a fatty liver patient? If you detect a fatty liver patient on ultrasound, 
or if you see a patient uh, with elevated liver enzymes, what are you going to do? It's a good algorithm from uh, hepatology, right? So, if you are if you have elevated liver enzymes and if you don't have symptoms, what you should be doing is to you take it as asymptomatic elevation of liver enzymes and you rule out all other liver diseases like hepatitis B, hepatitis C, if the patient is young, Wilson's disease, if the patient is a female, male autoimmune screen, and all these are negative, ultrasound scan says fatty liver, you treat it as fatty liver, and then you start them on lifestyle modification. If the liver enzymes come down, you can presume that it is fatty liver, and then you can go for FIB4 score, and FIB4 score is high risk, then go for fibro scan and that pathway. If you have ultrasound evidence of fatty liver, liver enzymes the same pathway, liver enzymes are high, liver enzymes are normal, you take this pathway and correct the risk factors for obesity, diabetes and dyslipidemia. According to these guidelines, all type 2 diabetics also should have their uh, liver enzymes and uh, ultrasound scan examination to rule out NAFL. In our guideline, in Sri Lankan guidelines, they do not recommend uh, screening for uh, type 2 diabetes for fatty liver, but they do, do recommend for all other illness like eyes, legs, kidneys, ECG, but not the liver. I think even our guidelines, uh, fatty liver should be in included because we are losing a lot of patients uh, because, uh, uh, because we cannot detect their uh, liver illness in time until they present with the hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, then little bit of liver transplantation, how uh, uh, difficult or easy for us to transplant these patients when they have fatty liver. Uh, as I told you before, they are not good liver transplant candidates because they are obese, they have diabetes, they have kidney disease, they have bad coronaries. So generally they are not good transplant candidates, but unfortunately they are the majority. Uh, so what can be done? So detect them early and make sure that, say, if you detect a cirrhotic who is going to need a transplant in five years, attend to those risk factors early so that keep their heart and the kidneys and the BMI and the things in good condition for them to undergo liver transplantation. And it's major obstacle for cadaver donor programs because fatty liver poor, fatty livers are poor graft survival. If you get a liver from a brain, brain dead patient, Either patient is obese or take an alcohol and, and he has already has a fatty liver, the donor, the brain dead liver, and it cannot be transplanted because if you transplant a fatty liver to a recipient, it has very poor graft survival. And even in live donor pro transplant programs, uh, uh, if you have a fatty liver, uh, very, uh, you know, uh, uh, lower chances of graft survival or we generally do not take fatty livers for transplantation even for cadaver you know, for uh, uh, live donor transplant programs. Uh, and in the transplanted liver, uh, almost all of them develop NASH but un unlikely to be clinically significant as I told earlier it takes 10, 20, 30, 40 years to develop uh, fibrosis and uh, decompensate. Uh, to summarize, ladies and gentlemen, chairperson, madam, uh, progressive fatty liver is mostly food related and the gut microbiome and genetics play a major role. Energy excess is the key. Uh, fibrosis stage predicts survival. So 95% will not progress, about 5% will progress and the progressing 5% you have to detect early and start interventions. Uh, lifestyle modification is the key, as I said, diet and exercise basically. 10% weight reduction is going to reverse fibrosis, but few can achieve it, unfortunately. Pharmacological breakthrough is close by and probably already there. Obeticolic acid is the front runner, Pro expected to be uh, recommended within next year or two. Statins have a major role to play, but appears underused. International guidelines, statements and guidelines appear inadequate, at least in our setup. 
So, how do you treat bird fat liver? Ask them to fly non-stop for seven days. And this is what you have to tell at the end. Thank you very much for kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Anuradha for that excellent lecture. Actually, when I proposed this topic, uh, you know, uh, not, uh, 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 therapeutic update on non-alcoholic seizure hepatitis, I was in two minds as to whether for a therapeutic update, whether there would be sufficient amount of things to talk about. But I think you have proved me, you know, uh, uh, dispelled all those doubts you have uh, really I, I learned a lot so there are a lot of new things coming up and uh, so I think um, uh, you have really uh, you know educated all of us I'm sorry that the postgraduates are not here because I think there is another the, uh, neurology update uh, which is happening in the hospital uh, so therefore most of them are here but I'm happy that we have the uh, recording so that we can at least uh, updating. So I'm sure you will be happy to take any uh, yes, questions. I'm Dr. Hirakoni, gynecologist. Uh, I learned a lot. So when the uh, professor says he learned a lot, <laughs> <laughs> that says something. And abs absolutely fascinating lecture. And I think you should really get it out to the public. So a lot of uh, doubts and uh, questions and misconceptions. Uh, two things I want to ask you really about. You, normally with diabetes you say sucrose is bad, fructose is good, stick to the, you know, good sugar, but you are turning it upside down. Uh, but the more important question I want to ask is about genetics. Now, supposing you diagnose a fatty liver in a parent, is it possible to test the children? So that you can catch them early, maybe too late for the parent, but at least you must save the next generation. What are the possibilities? Yeah, uh, two questions I'll, I'll answer separately. The first question about the fructose. What is bad is not the entire fruit. Commercially produced artificial fructose from corn syrup or the juice without the fiber produced from a fruit. So cordial is bad. Cordial is bad, but not the mango itself. Right. So mango juice is bad because we have thrown out the fiber. Right. So with the fiber, there is no harm. I don't know if you eat 10 mangoes, I don't know what's going to happen, but say what is the entire fruit is supposed to be good. But not the fructose commercially made because fructose is apparently cheaper and sweeter than sugar. Because of that, all commercially available sweets sweeteners and desserts are produced from fructose. High fructose corn syrup is produced from corn, but it is much cheaper than cane sugar. First, is the second question, the genetics. Yes, now what we do is that, see, even yesterday we saw the fourth person in the family with the hepatocellular carcinoma, all Nash, the three elder brothers are dead, then fourth came with the hepatocellular carcinoma at the age of 60. All of them can put it at the age of 60, 58, 60, 62. At the moment, that PNPLA3 gene testing is not commercially available. What we do is that, say, I, even that for that patient, I, I told them to come with all your, you know, all four brothers get together. Uh, children get to the can come here. At least start this stuff from the beginning. So, first thing is to detect cirrhosis. Now, FIB4 score, the very simple uh, liver test and the platelet count, and the, it will tell you what, the, you are at risk of fibrosis. If you are at risk of fibrosis, there are things that you can do weight reduction and start a drug, start a statin. Then, all these uh, uh, stages go on for years, more than 10 years, from NASH to fibrosis, 10 years. Fibrosis grade 1 to fibrosis grade 2, another 10 years. So, in fibrosis to cirrhosis, child's A, another 10 years. So, child's A to C, another 10 years. So, we have enough time to intervene and in, when you develop cirrhosis, we have enough time to get ready for a transplant and then uh, when you start, when you have child's A cirrhosis, you start screening them for hepatocellular carcinoma. 
the main cause for death is decompensation and the cancer. So decompensation you get ready with the liver transplant. For cancer you do scan them every six months to catch it when it is small, like three centimeter or two centimeter. Then you can either chop it off or you can burn it with uh, uh, microwave ablation, radio frequency ablation, taste. It's a lot of things that can be done for cancer. So, so all best is to you know get their children to a good person who is handling these uh, patients and I'm sure they can be saved. You, yes, men you mentioned about coffee yeah. is good for the yeah. this condition. Yeah. What about tea? There are so many green teas available in the country. So, madam, no evidence for green tea at all. In fact, green tea can be, you know, it can produce a drug in this liver disease. There is no evidence for green tea. Evidence is there for coffee. Not for normal tea also? No. Not for normal tea, not for green tea. I will also add a condensed one, it was an excellent lecture, and like Yadashna, I used to learn a lot. Thank you, madam. Thank you, madam. It was like the entire, the whole thing, you know, the condensed one now. It was excellent. It has become like, madam, earlier syphilis. You, you told us that if you know syphilis, you know medicine. Now it's like that. If you know fatty liver, you know medicine. Yeah. Well, uh, I think we have to stick to the lipid guidelines that we have. So we have certain target levels for diabetes. So very easy because almost all of them are diabetics, so we can stick to diabetes guidelines. The issue is that people were not using them in diabetics because their liver enzymes are high. So that's the case. So we should be starting statins on all these diabetics who have elevated the liver enzymes. Because what's called the drug induced, the statin induced idiosyncratic liver illness or the DILI, drug induced liver disease happens in 1 in 10 million. So it's very extremely rare. On the other hand, if you, you know, if you, there's 100% mortality if you have cirrhosis, it's worse than cancer. It's 100% mortality. Child cirrhosis not give, going to live more than one day. What about use of ursodeoxycholic acid? Sorry, madam, there is no absolutely no evidence for ursodeoxycholic acid. You have evidence for ursodeoxycholic acid only in primary biliary cirrhosis. That's the only illness where there is evidence for ursodeoxycholic acid. And also pregnancy, in pregnancy. Uh, Drug, uh, pregnancy induced cholestasis. Yeah. So now when we have patients with stage 1 and stage 2, apart from diet, exercise, weight reduction, we give vitamin E. After that, settings. And that, that, is that enough and just follow them up? Elevation of liver function and uh, scan every two years or so? What do you yeah. recommend? Yeah, madam. Now this is for a uh, uh, grade 1 fibrosis or cirrhosis? No, no. This is uh, a uh, nephrid. Right, okay. Nafal, now, uh, grade, now the grading given by the ultrasound, grade 1, grade 2, grade 3 is not enough for management. What you should have this uh, grading system which is based on the histology, which is closely mimicked by this FIB4 score, the score that I told you, and the fibro scan. We need the FIB4 score and the fibro scan to tell whether the fibrosis has set in. If the fibrosis has set in, then you have to go for this weight reduction plus vitamin E or the new drug which is available, lobotycholic acid. And then follow them, follow them up. Uh, this is a physiology question. You say the bird's liver can absorb fat very quickly and get rid of very quickly. Yeah. Humans don't seem to be able to do that. They are unable to do it. Now, if they lose weight by bariatric surgery, yeah. you lose your liver fat. But people, it's that said, it's a complex neuropsychological obesity. So, when we have food, now the birds, when they start flying from New Zealand to China, on the way for eight days, they don't have food. They can't eat. So, if you go to a place where there's no food, we lose your liver fat. But only thing is, we are we, when food is around, we just can't help it. We start it. Now, progression of nephrin. Yeah. Without alcohol. Yeah. Right? Are, I always advise my patients, don't drink alcohol because I don't know if my percentages are right. I want you to correct it. I say about 
Nephrid will develop cirrhosis uh, by the you know, Nephrid per se. And if yeah. you drink it, goes up to about 25%. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, I agree That's with you. Right, no? Yeah, I agree with you. Because they probably then two diseases coming together there. The, uh, the alcohol also increases liver fat content, and already you have got fatty liver already without alcohol. There probably two diseases coming together, and you know uh, progression is going to be much worse. That's why you said no liquor at all for these people. Uh, yeah, can I ask a few questions? And are they? Yes, again, I mean, brilliant uh, presentation. Uh, one thing is. Um, uh, acid, uh, sorry, uh, uh, obeticolic acid. Obeticolic acid. Yeah. Uh, is it registered in Sri Lanka? Uh, and is there a registered indication for it? Yes. Okay. Yes. There is a, the registered indication at the moment is primary biliary cirrhosis. Okay. It's registered. Right. Obeticolic acid. The the with, now this drug was uh, the first Flynn trial. The phase mm -hmm. two trial results came out in 2015. The results were so the data. I mean, the, uh, the because of the robustness of the drug, mm -hmm. people started using it like vitamin D from 2015 because there's no other alternative, yeah. right? Yeah. Then in 2019, the 3000, the phase three trial, interim results mm -hmm. came out. Mm -hmm. Then drug was already around because it was, it was registered for PBC. PBC yeah. Then people started uh, prescribing it for fatty liver. That's what I think. Yeah, so I think we should get it registered here if it is not registered. It's, I don't know. Yeah. I think it's already there. Already there. Yeah, yeah. Six, five, 5 milligram tablet is 60 rupees. Right. So 10 okay. milligram dose, 120. Right. And if you use the 25 milligram dose, it costs about 300 rupees. Okay. Right. But right. for a person like that, family yeah. history of cirrhosis mm -hmm. and cancer, I think for the child, it's yes. a drug. That's right. Yeah. Then, uh, secondly, vitamin E. Yeah. Why do you think there are no clinical trials? Because I think uh, as of now, there is no registered indication for vitamin E. Yeah. Right? So, why aren't people doing clinical trials? Uh, because there are some studies which have shown actually there are some side effects. So, I am just wondering whether you know people are not really uh, you know yeah, the people are happy to have it like uh, any way you give it because it's a vitamin uh, and uh, you know suspecting that there may be any uh, you know uh, I, the answer is that the plain, uh, the prevents trial in mm -hmm. 2010 it was a phase 2 trial 300 patients okay. right the, i think the uh, results were not strong enough mm -hmm. for them to go for a phase 3 trial Right. Because it was not, uh, the NASH improves, but fibrosis was not improving. Right. But with the obeticolic acid, even fibrosis stage improved. Right. Secondly, it may be such a tree drug, no, no pharma company wanted yeah. a phase three phase trial three. from it. Yeah. That may be one of the other reasons. Because all three drugs, the pre, pre the uh, drugs which were present at the moment, which were being tested like pyoprizone, vitamin E, and liraglutide never went into a phase three trial. Mm. The drug came from the industry went for a phase three trial. Mm -hmm. okay. That may be one of the reasons. So, do you recommend pyoprizone as well as liraglutide for uh, patients with uh, patient who, who is so say if you take a diabetic mm -hmm. who has snatch can go for those two drugs, but not the not the patient not yeah. without diabetes. Yeah. So it's like one of those recommendations if you know considered in the comorbidities. Yeah. yeah. Over another one, yeah. uh, you can consider. Uh, one more thing: this low platelet count is yeah. it related to the fibrosis and uh, fibrosclerosis? Yeah. Right. So that's very is sensitive platelet. Yeah. Yeah. This or AST, LT, and the platelet, platelet count, count yeah. absolutely sensitive. It won't mm. cost you five hundred rupees, okay, yeah. but it's almost equal sensitive to the fibroscan to detect okay. uh, fibrosis early. Very robust evidence for that mm -hmm. FIB4 scope. Mm -hmm. So fibrous can, can be done in your centre now? Uh, Pragma, Pragma, there Pragma? is one, and okay. in the private sector, there is one. Nowlo has one. Nowlo has. Nowlo has. So with the fibrous can, you don't really need to do biopsy. No, no, madam, no. Mm -hmm. And at what stage of time, Ms. do you progress from vitamin E to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to a statin? Statin, madam, from the beginning. If there is an indication from the beginning, because if you now the amount of research going on in cirrhosis, established cirrhosis with a statin, because it reduces, reduce, re, retards progression. 
like like what's happening in with captopril and you can remember 20 years ago when captopril came to the market what what it says that it, it improves survival in heart disease at that time digoxin was you know digoxin was the drug but it was not prolonging the survival but then came captopril then carvedilol then aldactone uh, spinalactone and so on the drugs came which improves survival like that statin is going to be the first drug probably going to improve survival in uh, established cirrhosis. A lot of trials are going on with statins. Of course, now reality will be always when, uh, when we, before we start statins, they have blue report, left it because mm -hmm. now it says STPD goes up more than double, they will, they will stop statins yeah. or reduce the dose. They, that that no longer valid. That's now, no longer now, valid. now what they say is you test mm -hmm. the liver enzymes if you become symptomatic. Not, not, there's a lot of actually, I think, uh, misconceptions about yeah. uh, you know liver enzymes and, and statins. Yeah, because, because it raises liver enzymes on, I mean, some due to some physiological reasons, no liver damage. So, say it raises liver enzymes, say one in hundred, but damages the liver in one in one million, something like that. So, so you test your liver enzymes if the patient becomes symptomatic. Otherwise, you are going to stop a statin in a patient who really deserve it. And, uh, and this uh, transient liver enzyme elevation apparently comes down. Very, very, know, uh, it comes yeah, down within, with use. When you, it continues. Yeah, continue, it it's going to, yeah. that's why I said don't test it. Because if you test it, you get scared and stop it. And I think there, are, uh, there aren't any cases of definite liver, uh, you know, failure uh, which is yeah. linked to uh, statins. No, no. Two, there are two. There is one case with simvastatin, one case with atovastatin, none with rosuvastatin. That's of the currently used drugs. There may be one case each for simvastatin. That's about how many prescriptions? Yeah. 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 One in yeah. billion. Yeah. And that also, we, what I have uh, read is there could be some other confounding factors which were contributory. Maybe. Yeah. Definitively, that you can identify linked to a statin. Yeah, I, I went through a delay registry yeah, in okay. the U, U.S. Okay. So it gives you all the possible uh, deaths related to drugs. Mm. So yeah. there's one case for stat yeah. sigma statin, one case for atostatin. That's all. Some pain, there are some people who, you know, some people who do on the social media all the time. Mm. So they say the statins are bad, it atrophy, your brain gets atrophy, this and that. So yeah. that time, there, there are some people even stop statins. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Because of this yeah. uh, social media, you know. So I think still. Uh, very good indication of statins. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I think uh, still on the brain because there are some, you know, links to like dementia and so on. Diabetes. Uh, so also, right? yes, uh, and di uh, certainly diabetes, uh, which are I think diabetes there is some evidence, but dementia again there is no because some studies show that dementia is reduced. Some studies show de dementia is, uh, uh, you know linked uh, to statins, but so it's uh, there is no definite uh, evidence. But I think uh, uh, liver disease, of course, there is clear evidence that it is protective. protective. So we should actually promote, I think, uh, as you quite rightly said, uh, giving statins to patients with uh, fatty liver. Yeah, I think uh, we had an excellent lecture followed by another excellent uh, discussion. So I'm very thankful to uh, Professor Anuradha Dasanayaka for educating all of us. And I'm happy that we have recorded it so that it can be made use of. I think we should, you know, publicize that this uh, excellent lecture is available for people to watch through the uh, video link. Thank you very much, Anuradha. I have the Thank you.